Mike Ismanzi. I'm sitting here today with Taliansis. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Ismanzi. Sure, my pleasure. Good for you for doing this. Many of us know who Taliansis is, but we're here today because we want to examine the building blocks of what makes Taliansis Taliansis. So, with that being said, I want to ask you the first question. Is there any struggle that you encountered as a kid that you'd like to tell us that we may not know about but can relate to? Things that I had to overcome, um, and I really faced this when I went to college. Um, you know, all of my roommates, their fathers and mothers had gone to college, and right. they were doctors or lawyers or right. politicians, and they had careers. <clears throat> and and you know, my dad was a waiter, and so. And the first time I ever visited the campus of Georgetown University is when I enrolled, yeah, uh, awesome. and and I had no no um, background of people who had gone to college that I could talk to about their experience. When I started my first company uh, on campus at Georgetown University, um, there was no one I could talked to when I started my first business when I graduated from college. Right. Um, I, I didn't have, have business mentors, so I had to kind of do it my, on my own. And there's a great fear that you face. And, and the big fear, which I've, I've learned, is a false fear imprinted on us by by society at large that maybe right. doesn't want you to try to win right. um, is failure. Failure is to be embraced because most of the great advances um, in science and healthcare and technology grew out of unbelievable failures. And, and the entrepreneur in any of those fields that just said, it's not a failure, I just haven't found that right answer. And I'll keep pushing, I'll keep trying, I'll, right. I'll look at it from every angle to get over that, that failure issue. And that, that culture now is changing and starting to say that it's okay to fail as long as you pick yourself back up and move forward. You talked about how when you were growing up, you lived in a community that you didn't really know anyone and when you started your business at Georgetown, you didn't really know anybody. But um, we've heard that you've had a mentor, a Jesuit mentor at Georgetown University that <coughs> had a significant influence in your life. Can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with him and how he impacted you? Sure. When, when I went to Georgetown University um, the first couple of years, I was an outlier. Um, I didn't go to private schools. I, I wasn't a, an alum. My, my mom and dad didn't go to college and um, I, was, I was scared. And a couple of things that differentiated me, I interned on the hill, I got a job in a shoe store, I worked in our library. I, I needed jobs to make money because my parents literally didn't give me any money for right. books and spending money and, and the like. So you were grinding as we would say today. So I was grinding but that was such a great um, opportunity for me to learn how to manage my time and how much bandwidth I really had and how much more productive I could be than some of my roommates right. who were still my close friends who right. would sit around and drink beer and watch exactly. television and sleep late. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, so that set a foundation for me, that hard work and that you could manage multiple things at the same time. And at Georgetown, which is a, a Jesuit university, um, your junior year you're given a mentor, someone who's to help you and start to talk to you about your life after college, but also to work with you on this big deliverable, the big thing that you had to do for the school to graduate, which was this interdisciplinary thesis. And so I was assigned uh, a mentor. He was a 75-year-old priest. His name was Father Joseph Durkin. And short of my 
my mom and dad, probably the most influential grown up in my life. And it was a accidental mentoring is what I'd say. I remember when I first met him, leaving, talking to one of my roommates, thinking I got a raw deal. Like, yeah. What am I going to have in common with a 75-year-old Jesuit priest? I'm not Catholic, you know. Yeah. He, how can he relate to my experience as a student? And so he, as a intellectual, he wrote 99 books during his life. Um, he kept pushing me to get serious about what I would write for my senior thesis. And um, I was a lazy kid, I wasn't a great student at the time. And so I went into the library, uh, Orange Library at Georgetown, in search of the shortest, easiest book to read. <laughs> Sounds like me, that's what I <laughs> And so I went into the library and I literally was scanning and the skinniest book that I found was a book called Old Man in the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. And I read it and I went to see Father Durkin and he said, well, tell me what the book is about. And I gave him a very naive overview of the book. And, and he said, you're smarter than this. I want you to go back and read the book and find the deeper meaning, what, what what's he really trying to talk about. Right. And, and I did, and there was a lot of spiritualism and religious studies, and, and, and so I, I had a more meaningful conversation with him. And he said, okay, now we're getting someplace. Right. Why don't you go read his next book? And so I went to the library, the next book I pulled out was like this thick. Yeah. <laughs> and I read across the river and into the trees and it was like they were from two different writers from two different times and and I had an idea as I started to build this body of work by Hemingway that he wrote Old Man in the Sea it said in 1951 but I believe that he wrote it earlier in his career, in the 30s. And Father Durkin said, now that's an original thought. And I said, yeah, how am I gonna prove it? And he said, well, you tell me how you're gonna prove it. And I said, well, maybe I could meet his wife or talk to his publisher to try to get the straight story. Right. And Father Durkin looked at me and said, well, why don't you use a computer? And it was 1976, there was one computer on the campus of Georgetown University. Um, an IBM 360 computer in the registrar's office. Um, your iPhone today has more computing power than the entire campus and every student on campus. And I said, I don't even know what a computer is. And and he said, well, let's go find the guy who runs the computer and see if he has any ideas, which we did. And we came up with an idea. He introduced me to a woman who was a linguistics major. And we ended up writing, I believe, one of the first algorithms. He, they, they had me type into this punch card system the first 5,000 words of Old Man in the Sea and then the first 5,000 words of like 10 books and articles and then the linguistics major came up with these measures, words per sentences, sentences per paragraph, pronoun references and then we asked the computer based on all of these measures, when was Old Man in the Sea written? And the computer said 1932, not 1951. Wow. And, and it was like this gigantic light bulb went off that I went from, let me cheat yeah. and find the smallest book in the library to read to being introduced to computer technology and an algorithmic search 
and and that I could do something original. Um, you know, I was scared to death that what if the computer said 1948, yeah. or what if the it didn't work, right. and. And the only time that I could get computer time was like midnight or two o'clock in the morning. And, and so, so all this stuff really came together and, and it won best, you know, best, um, best thesis, gave me a lot of confidence that I could compete with all these really, really smart other students. But it really opened my eyes to this coming day, this was 38 years ago, where computers would be a part of our life. And, and I'll, I remember Father Durkin was very proud of me, and he said, um, this is the first time where technology and liberal arts have come together. And maybe five years ago I was reading Walter Isaacson's book on Steve Jobs okay. and Apple had become the world's most valuable company and Steve was asked by an analyst you know what's so special about Apple and he said Apple is the place where liberal arts and technology come together and I, I just remember looking at that saying Father Durkin was a genius and I owe everything in my career to that seminal moment. If I don't go in the library and take Old Man in the Sea and Father Durkin doesn't say let's use a computer, I have absolutely zero idea where I would be right now. Exactly. And so to piggyback off of that, is that where you came up with your idea for the company list? So being an entrepreneur, um, you get inspiration from many places. Mm -hmm. um, I started my first company on campus. I was very productive during my, my Georgetown career. Um, I was always hustling, trying to work, trying to figure out ways to make money. And I was reading the Washington Post and there was a front page story that said 35 million tourists were coming to Washington DC to celebrate the bicentennial summer. And I said, you know, what, what can we sell these people? Right. And one of my roommates said, well, you could sell snow to Eskimos. I'll never <laughs> forget that. That was the term he used. And I said, snow to Eskimos, snow cones. Right. Red, white, and blue snow cones. Be a patriot, eat a snow cone. And he, he grew up in a wealthy family. He said, I will be your banker. I'll, I'll put up money wow. and I'll get ownership and you can buy the stuff and, and so I, I launched my first business uh, while a student at Georgetown University. Learned a lot, learned the early bird catches the worm. Right. You had to be up early to get the great locations in Georgetown in order to sell the, the snow. and. Um, I, I also learned about margins and products. Still to this day, snow cones are the best margin product. It's ice, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's ice water frozen, and some Kool-Aid yeah. on top. Exactly. And we introduced, we were innovators. We had variable pricing. If it was 80 degrees or less, it was 50 cents. If it was 80 to 90 degrees, it was 75 cents. If it was 90 to 100 degrees, it was a dollar. If it was over 100 degrees, we negotiated yeah. what was the fair price, price right. for this for this snow Very cone. smart, very smart. So, so when I I started my first career outside of um, out of college, I worked for a computer company, and and. At this computer company, I, I ended up going to the West Coast Computer Fair, and in 1979, I bought my first computer. It was an Apple II computer, and, and back then, they weren't really computers. You would buy a, a CRT screen from one vendor and a keyboard from another vendor. You would buy the how-to manual from someone outside the, the hall, um, and Apple made then a motherboard. And then you'd have to put it together. And so I had one of the first Apple II computers, and I, I went to this trade show and listened to speeches, and I bought a couple of pieces of software, and, 
if you can believe it, there was an operating system, was called the CPM operating system. Mm -hmm. You have to buy a separate operating system, and put it into the computer, and I had a couple of programs. And so one, one day, months after I'd bought this computer, I went to a grocery store, was doing my shopping, and at the checkout line, there was a, a TV guide being sold near the cash register. And I'll never forget this, there was this big starburst that said the number one best-selling magazine in America. And, and that jumped out at me because I had never seen a TV guide. My right. parents never bought a TV guide. So I bought it and I came home and, and I opened up the magazine. The front of the magazine was interviews with television stars and television directors and producers. And the back of the book was a directory of what program played on what network at what time. Right. I'm thinking, that's odd that this is such an important magazine. And then later that night, I went into my little home office and was sitting in front of my Apple II computer. And it, it had glass. It had a screen. Yeah. And it, I had these three programs aside it. And, and I had heard at the West Coast Computer Fair Dr. Bob Metcalf talking about Ethernet networks, networks that would connect computers and they would talk together. And I, I had another one of those kind of whack on the side of the head moments. I said, this computer looks like a TV. Right. And TV guides talking about programs. And I've got these three programs aside it. And TV Guy talks about networks, NBC, ABC, CBS. But Dr. Metcalf was talking about networks, Ethernet. This was way before the web and mm -hmm. Internet. And I, I just had this moment where I said, my bet is that all of this is going to be indistinguishable, that televisions and telephones and computers, just glass, just glass and some way to input and that everything will go and become software or digital at some point. So I, I quit my job. My mom and dad thought I was crazy. I had a good yeah, job. It and take a little bit of guts to do that. Um, yeah, although... You know, I was young, I wasn't married, I didn't have any kids, I didn't have a mortgage, right. and, um, and I, I envisioned a TV guide-like property for this new developing personal computer world. And so my idea was create a database of every program that worked on every network that worked on every computer. And it was called LIST, the Leonsis Index to Software Technology. And I raised some venture capital, um, knew a, a guy who I had grown up with and we become close friends. And he worked at an investment bank. <laughs> and he introduced me to this investment committee. And I went in one pitch. I only made one pitch, 15-page business plan. and. Um, the head of the company said, um, none of us understand a word you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Computers, networks. And he said, but you could sell snow to Eskimos. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> said, my college roommate said that when I started my snow cone yeah, business. That's awesome. He said, we're going to back your company. And, and so that's how that first business was born. It hit it, I mean, a year later, IBM introduced the PC. We did a deal with IBM. When the Mac was being introduced in 84, we did a deal with Steve Jobs. We did a deal with Sun Microsystems, and all of a sudden, we had built a, a business of size. And a few years later, I was able to sell that business to a large international publishing company. And then that led me to start my second company, called Redgate Communications, 
It was really one of the first, if not the first, new media marketing like companies. Mm -hmm. And that company merged with a young company called America Online, okay. and awesome. that's how I became president of America Online. Well, Mr. McCallison, we're out of time, but thank you for joining us. Pleasure to have you here today. Great. We're very happy you came. Thanks, thank you. Good for you.